Ruchim Aboyim, thank you for coming. We are now on the third lecture of the topic of charity. Last week we talked about the Rambam and his eight degrees of charity. Pirkei Avos, the ethics of the fathers, in chapter five, um, first um, Mishnah number 13, also talks about uh, charity. And he gives four different degrees of charity. And it says here that there are four traits among those who give charity. It says, If someone wants to give, but he doesn't want others to give. It uses the term, that he only has a bad eye towards others. And again, the word eno for the eye. The next category is someone who thinks others should give, but that he should not. And it says with him, he's only, his evil eye is only, his eye is only evil by himself. The third category is that he should give and others should also give. He's called chassid. And the last category is that he shouldn't give and neither should others. He's called the Russia. He's called an evil person. So we have these four categories, and I think it's important to look at them. It's interesting that the first category of a person who he wants to give, but he doesn't want others to give. So he says, ain't no raw, that what he's doing is he's trying to give an, an evil eye, that he wants to take all the credit for himself. Because he understands, he knows that a person who gives the duck, as we mentioned last time, that the one mitzvah, you can test God on is giving charity. Aser to asher, that if you give charity, that you'll get wealthy. And that the people, God says, this you can test. Well, normally you can't test God. So therefore, he wants to be the one to give. And not others. So he's, so to speak, giving an evil eye to others so they don't give, so they don't come wealthy. So he wants to keep it all to himself. Whereas the second category where he wants others to give and not himself, again, he becomes, he's stingy, and he's a miser. And even though it may hurt himself, he just can't let go of that money. And again, it's a trait that some people have. It's, you know, there's a, many religious people, they never let their hand go below their belt, which is done in a more of, is more of a sexual connotation. But it also means people are very stingy. They don't go into their pocket to give charity. Their hand never goes below their belt. And the person, again, like that is a very difficult trait to have. The person, again, is considered to be an ayin hara. Something is bad for himself. And the third person, again, is very simply, he, he wants to give and he wants others to give. And that's how a person should be. It's interesting that um, <clears throat> there used to be, still are today, charity drives and sometimes you'll hear about someone who will they'll say someone has donated 25000 on the condition that we can match the fund, matching funds. So he'll match up to 25000 whatever's given. And I used to think when I first heard that, oh, it's really silly. If the guy wants to give twenty five, then let him just give the money. Why does he have to make it conditional that other people give? Because many times they make it sound like if they don't get the money, they won't get his money either. So they have to raise that second 25 to get the first 25. And then I came to realize that it's really a great thing because what the person is doing is not only is he giving, and he's, giving, he's getting other people to give. And my thought is always that that person is going to give the 25 either way. It's just that he wants to in, in, entice people to give do that mitzvah tzedakah. And again, not only that, it's always a good lesson for all things should always judge things the cop schut. Always see things in a positive way. I'll give another example of that as well. And then the other is that the person uh, that uh, he doesn't give and he doesn't want others to give. That's really the worst. Um, he doesn't want anyone to be better than him. So the way you do that is you talk other people into saying that why should you give? Look at the guy. He doesn't need charity. And here he is out with his hand out. You know, why should we give anything to him? And he tries to justify the fact that he's cheap. And again, as we've mentioned before, that uh, the ridiculous statement of God made someone poor, where we'd argue 
again, which has no logic. I remember being in uh, Eretz Yisrael at the Kotel, and a very well-dressed young man in a kapata, a long coat, hat, looked very sharp, had his hand out for charity. And your, the first reaction that you have is, give me a break, you know? He looks like he should be giving, you know, not having his hand out getting. And then it dawned on me, and I'm sure that's what it was, that he had a friend who needed charity. And his friend was so poor, but at the same time so embarrassed by being poor that he didn't have the wherewithal, didn't have the ability to ask anyone. So his friend who had a little bit more money and a little more character, he went out and he put out his hand and he asked for his friend and that's what he was really doing, not asking for himself. And that's what we need to see people. Because the truth of the matter is, I think the hard, as hard as it is for some people to give charity, you really still feel good afterwards. That's with most mitzvahs. I think the harder thing to do is be a charity collector, to go out and to ask people for money. Um, it's, a, it's a embarrassing, and sometimes people try to avoid you. There are many negatives to it. So for a person, again, we need to remember that when a person comes and asks for donations, that we need to treat them with respect. And again, try to give as much as we can. And always think that when a person puts out his hand, if he doesn't look like he needs it personally, that of course he's asking for someone else. And that's what we're dealing with. Now, again, the question becomes, how much charity do you give and to whom do you give? Um, I had a friend in the neighborhood where there were people constantly knocking on the door asking for charity. And it was very difficult. So what he did is he would just give everybody $5. Now, is that enough? I don't know. It's up to a person to decide. It depends what a person's livelihood is and what he can afford. But if a person puts out his hand, it's not for us to judge who the person is and what he should get. We should just put something in it. So if a person asks, the person has demeaned himself to ask for charity, so this person has set up an amount since he has people knocking on the door all the time. I'm sure there are times he gives more. But for the most part, he's not saying no to anyone. And therefore, he gives to everyone. And he gives a certain amount. And this way, it's, it's set. You know, they, um, we've talked, we talk sometimes about the atbash, the Kabbalistic ways of taking the Hebrew alphabet by exchanging the first letter, Aleph, for tough, at, second letter base for shin, bash, called the atbash. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. You can exchange them, and there's, the secret codes come out when you do that. You get different words, different numerical values, gematrias, which we've talked about. But what's interesting is that the word sadaka in the atbash is sadaka. It doesn't change. It stays the same. There's a uh, great story of a... Uh, poor man who lived in the town of Rimenov and um, he had a daughter to marry off and he really didn't have the money and he worked up the nerve to go to the richest man in the city and uh, he said to him that he needed a loan for 1,000 rubles and the rich man kind of chuckled and said uh, how are you going to pay me back and um, he said he would. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll loan you the money if you can bring me the signature guarantor of another rich man who will guarantee your loan. I'll give it to you. So Lezer, this poor man, went to the synagogue. He opened up the ark. And there's a uh, posset, there's a verse that says, Lia kesev li azov nuom Hashem which translates literally to me, to me is the silver and gold, so says God. He wasn't, he was a simple man. And the way he read the verse, it said, Li HaKesev, that I will deal with silver and gold, signed Hashem. So he wrote this down on a piece of paper and signed it. 
And he took this piece of paper with what he had written, and he handed it to this rich man. And the rich man was amused. And because of that, and he saw the simple faith that this Eliezer had, he gave him the thousand rules. And not long after, he walked into his office, and there he saw an envelope with his name on it. And he opened the envelope, and inside of it there was a thousand rubles. And when he saw that, he felt kind of bad. He felt that Eliezer, Eliezer had been, he had pushed him a bit, and he thought he hadn't been kind enough. And when he saw Rabbi Eliezer, he said to him, you know, you didn't have to pay me back so quickly. You know, it's not a problem. And he didn't know what he was talking about. He said, I never paid you back. He said, well, someone left an envelope on the desk, and it was for you to pay back your loan. So they, they but Lesser suggested that they go see the Tzaddik from Mendel of Ramanov, the Ramanover, and ask him about the conflicting stories. He said he paid, he said he didn't pay. So when the Tzaddik, when the, when the righteous rabbi saw the envelope and heard the story, he kissed the envelope. And he said that when this poor simple man had signed God's name to the document, there was a big uproar in heaven. And he said that everyone there, Abraham, Abraham Avinu said he wanted to pay back the debt. The Yitzhak said, no, he wanted to pay back the debt. And Yaakov Avinu said, no, no, he wants to pay back the debt. Even Moshe Rabbeinu, even Moses, said he wanted to pay it. But finally, the honor was bestowed upon Elio Anavi, Elijah the prophet. And remember, turned to the rich man and said, if you had believed when this man signed God's name that God would pay you back, you would have had the honor and privilege of seeing Elio himself and that he would have paid you back. You would have seen his face. So we see that God stands in the place of poor people. God takes care of them. And a person needs to know that the word lechem, that the word bread and melech, salt, are the same word. The way to salt your bread is to, you put a little salt on meat, it may shrink a little, but it preserves it. And so too with money. When a person gives charity, that's the way for him to preserve all of his wealth. <laughs> There's a great rabbi who said the greatest possession in the world is poverty. You can't buy it for all the money in the world. And a person needs to know that when a person is poor, that his place is assured in the world to come. Because whatever suffering he has, he has in this world. And he goes directly to a high place in heaven. So it seems many times to be a negative can be a positive. It's like a 401k. He's sending all of his money to when he retires in the next world, which again will take care of everything that he needs. Very quickly, at the end with the story of Rabzusha. The Rabzusha had a rich man that came to him all the time and gave him money. And one day the rich man came and Rabzusha wasn't home. And the rich man understood that the reason why he was successful was because of the blessings Rabzusha gave him. So he asked his Rabzusha's wife where Rabzusha was and his wife said that he went to go see his Rebbe, the Magad of Mizrich. The rich man being astute decided that if he was making, doing so well dealing with Rabzusha, if he dealt with Reb Zusha's rabbi, he'd even do better. So what he did was he stopped going to Reb Zusha and he went to the Magid. The problem was he saw that his wealth was going south. He was losing money, not making money. So he quickly went to go see Reb Zusha. He said to Reb Zusha, tell me, who's greater, you or the Magid? <laughs> Reb Zusha kind of chuckled. It's not even a question. I'm nothing compared to the Magid. So Richman said, I don't get it then. When I gave you money, I was doing very well in business. When I started giving money to the Magad, you say it's greater than you, my business went sour. So how is that? Rizusha smiled and he said, it's really very logical. You see, when you give money to the Magad, he deserves for you to give the money. So in heaven, they see to see, looked in your record to see if you deserve to become wealthy. On the other hand, when you give me money, I really don't deserve what you give me. So since you give it to me without me deserving, they give it to you without you deserving. So a person needs to know. Don't be so critical. Don't look so carefully. 
because heaven will teach, treat you the way that you treat the poor. Open your hand and open your heart. And with that, we'll bring the coming of Mashiach, the Messiah, quickly in our time. Thank you very much for coming. God bless and have a great job.